Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Peter replied, repent and be baptized, each of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this verse has been used by so many people to try to prove this false doctrine called baptismal regeneration, which is the false teaching that suggests that in order for you to experience the forgiveness of your sins, as this verse says right here, you have to not only repent, but you also have to be baptized. And then and only then will you receive this precious gift of the Holy Spirit. So in this video, we're gonna debunk that and I'm gonna share with you the different possibilities of what this verse actually means, and then I'm gonna show you what I believe it means. Possibility number one, both baptism and repentance are necessary for salvation. But is this really true? What does the rest of the Bible have to say about this? See, whenever we let the Bible interpret the Bible, we will see that this verse cannot mean what many people say it means. Let's see what the rest of the Bible says. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world in this way, he gave his own, one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 36, the one who believes in the son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Romans chapter 11, now if by grace, then it is not by works, Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. So not only do these scriptures make no mention at all of baptism being combined with belief, but it also says this in the exact same book, in the book of Acts. Notice later on in Acts, Peter says this, therefore repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. No mention of baptism. He then again says this, all the prophets testify about him that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. And then finally in Acts chapter 26, instead I preached to those in Damascus first and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. So notice nowhere in any of these verses in the collective of scripture does it communicate that baptism and repentance are necessary for salvation. So I would say possibility number one is not a possible, but still that asks the question, what does this verse actually mean? Because it sounds like it means that. Possibility number two, an alternate interpretation of quote unquote, for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins. You see, the reality is that the preposition, I don't wanna to go too deep, but the Greek preposition here in Acts chapter two, verse 38, for the word for is actually the word eis, E-I-S. And in some uses of this preposition in the New Testament, it is interpreted as on the basis of or because of. And so if we interpret it that way, then the verse would read more so, repent and be baptized each of you because of the forgiveness of your sins or on the basis of the forgiveness of your sins or in response to you actually experiencing the forgiveness of your sins. In other words, this communicates that baptism, yes, indeed is a command, but it is a command to the believer to do after they have experienced the forgiveness of their sins. Now, this is consistent because even in scripture, we see examples of people experiencing true salvation without ever even experiencing baptism. Notice what it says here in Luke chapter seven. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Notice there is no mention at all of baptism here. And Jesus confirms that this woman, because she placed her faith in him, that she was saved. And then it says here in Matthew nine, just then some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a stretcher, seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, have courage, son, your sins are forgiven. Once again, no mention of baptism. But the most convincing of all of these is actually the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Let's read it and let's see what it says. But while Peter was still speaking these words, 
the Holy Spirit came down on all those who had heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Now, how could the Holy Spirit fall upon these people if they were not first saved to begin with? But I want you to now go a little bit deeper and I want you to notice when they were baptized. A few verses later, it says this, can anyone withhold water and prevent these people from being baptized who have received past tense, the Holy Spirit, just as we have. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. Now, we can see very clearly here that they were baptized after they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives, but this is not the strongest possibility because to be fair to the text, the use of this preparation EIS isn't typically translated as on the basis of or because of, although all the stories that I just mentioned regarding people being saved before they were baptized was actually true. So let's move on to the next possible interpretation of this verse. Possibility number three is what we're gonna call the parenthetical interpretation. And this has actually some merit to it because people who hold to this view see this clause, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ as parenthetical. In other words, they see it read this way, repent, parentheses, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, parentheses, for the forgiveness of your sins. So in other words, they are tying the forgiveness of your sins to the main verb of the sentence, repent. So repent for the forgiveness of your sins. And then while you're there, okay, yes, be baptized, but they're not tying that verb, be baptized, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, I don't wanna go into all the Greek, but basically the verb repent is in the plural, and then uh, for the forgiveness of your sins is also plural, but then the verb to be baptized is singular, so on and so forth. I don't wanna go into all of that, but the point is that this one has some merit because they see that clause as being parenthetical, which would then solve the problem. But I think that there's a stronger interpretation that trumps them all, and that is the one that I'm gonna call the specific context. Now, if we look at the specific context of this passage, Peter just preached a message that encouraged these people to look at themselves and say, wow, what are we going to do now? We have no other choice but to repent. And so they ask him, they say, it says here, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what should we do? In other words, we are convicted. We believe that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. What's the next step? What should we do? And I want you to notice that Peter now says, repent and be baptized. Now, why would he do this? He is challenging this specific group of people to repent and be baptized right away. Why? Because he knew that in this time, you were basically going to sign up for public scrutiny and maybe even a death sentence if you publicly associated yourself with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, People were being kicked out of the synagogue for placing their faith in Jesus Christ at this time. Notice it says here in John chapter nine, his parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews since the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. So what is Peter challenging this group of people to do? He's challenging them to make their faith public. Take a stand and say, okay, hey, I am getting baptized publicly to let all of the people in the world know that I am now standing for Christ. Now, although baptism is a command, the question is, is it something that we have to do immediately at the moment we get saved in order to be saved? Well, if we also take a look at the story of the rich young ruler, what we will notice here in this interesting story is that Jesus basically challenges this rich young ruler to give up all of his possessions. Let's read it. A ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says, hey, obey the commandments, do these things. He says, well, I've already done all that. And then Jesus says this, you still lack one thing, sell all you have and distribute it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. Was Jesus saying that every single Christian throughout the history of time in order to be saved or to inherit eternal life 
You have to believe and you have to sell all of your possessions to the poor and give them away. And then and only then will you find eternal life. No, he was basically challenging this young man, just like Peter was challenging that group to allow Jesus to accept, to embrace Jesus being Lord. And for this young man specifically, that meant making him God instead of his money and his possessions as God. For that group in Acts chapter two specifically, it meant making their faith public. So I believe that it is this interpretation that is the best as it relates to Acts chapter two, verse 38. So hopefully we can put to rest this false teaching of baptismal regeneration, this idea that you have to do one extra step, i.e. get baptized so you can complete your salvation. Listen, yes, Jesus did command that we should be baptized and the longer you go without getting baptized, you are living in disobedience to that command, but that doesn't mean that you're not saved. That doesn't mean that you have to do something now in order to complete your salvation, because as you can see today, a clear understanding of how to interpret the scriptures and break them down is the key to getting the right perspective. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, down below, let me know some other confusing scriptures that you want me to hopefully clear up and I'll do that in, this, in uh, future coming videos. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.